Here, boy. Oh, come on, boy. Come on, boy. I told you if that dog ever came in the same room with me again, I'd kill him. Graham, have you got your gun? Well, yes, sir, but... Well, take that dog outside and shoot him. Giles, you can't be serious. Did you hear me? No, sir, I can't. Don't you know, sir, me? You do what I say or you write your resignation. Welcome back to Red TV. Enjoy another captivating episode of the new Perry Mason show, featuring the case of the Telltale Trunk, originally aired on October 14, 1973. You're drunk on money. What's the matter with you? I turn your crummy hundred thousand and a couple of broken down fried cooks into forty million dollars. Everybody in the country knows about catered affairs, instant gourmet dinners. What about them? Huh? Where's their share? They trusted you and you knife them. What do you think, Graham? Did I knife them? I would say the blade resembled more that of a guillotine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and they're out there in the guest house. All of them bleeding copiously. <laughs> well, Perry, what do you think? Can you do this to us? Ray, I urged you to attempt to renegotiate these contracts two years ago. How come you never told us, Ray? I can only advise that you have no cause of action at all. Some advice. The rug is pulled out from under us, and all we're supposed to do is fall down. Clauses in your contracts allowing catered affairs enterprises to repurchase your stock at 100% profit were for your protection. A court would rule that Belden is perfectly within his rights to exercise his option within the stipulated five-year period. I never thought he'd pull this. You heard him at lunch, Ray. He's pulling it. Those contracts were executed five years ago in 1965. Tuesday's the anniversary date. Unless you can talk him out of it by then. Have you ever tried to talk Giles Belden out of anything? Say, sweetie, that's an idea. Why don't you use some of that sexy charm of yours and try and con him out of it? Shut up. <laughs> Perry, I'm sorry you had to drive all the way out here on a Sunday. So am I. Perry, I don't like seeing what happens when clients pay for advice and then don't take it. If you have any further questions, call me. Thank you. Yeah, counselor, I have a further question. How much did Giles Belden pay you to tell us what you just told us? Victor, Perry Mason is not only my attorney, he's also my friend. Giles Belden was my friend. Mr. Harding, I've never met your friend, the franchise tycoon. But I'll give you an opinion. No charge at all. Unless a miracle happens when Tuesday comes. 
Your friend is going to exercise those options. That must be Norman's attorney leaving. Good riddance. He'd go blind looking for a loophole. <laughs> it's too bad he didn't come earlier. He missed the going away party. <laughs> with me again, I'd kill him. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Graham, have you got your gun? Well, yes, sir, but... Well, take that dog outside and shoot him. Giles, you can't be serious. Did you hear me? No, sir, I can't. Oh, don't you know, sir, me? You do what I say or you write your resignation. No. No. It's not your time yet, fella. Go on. Go on now. Up. He probably just shot his wife and Graham. And then there was none. Well, hello. Giles pays off with $20,000. Incredible. Our interest should be worth at least, oh, oh, how much, Ray? A million, million two. Gratitude of a rattlesnake. Well, at least you're well fortified with snake bite remedy. Here we are, swindled out of a million bucks apiece, and she's got time for drunk jokes. Sorry you ever got me in this deal, Ray. Don't start blaming me, Victor. I not only put my money in catered affairs, but I also invested five years of my life, seven days a week since 1965. And when Giles Belden gives me that paycheck of $20,000 on Tuesday, there'll probably be a pink slip with it. I'd like to kill that man. Do it before Tuesday and win yourself an award for cleaning up the ecology. It's not impossible. What? I said, it's not impossible to kill him. And get this, Jennifer, Victor. Only the one who did it will know who killed him. Ray, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about substituting the $20,000 that Belden will give each of us for a million dollars. Well, maybe you, uh, maybe you don't want to hear anymore. For a million bucks, I'll listen. Anonymity. That's the name of the game. Now... We take three strips of paper. Red. Blue. Green. And only these three strips of paper know who did what. We fold them into this box. And then each of us Draw one. Whoever drew the green slip is responsible for buying a steamer-sized trunk, one that can be sealed shut, locked securely. Then, Mr. Green, or Miss Green, as the case may be, has the trunk delivered to our old warehouse office where catered affairs started. Then Green is through with his or her part of the job. And only Green knows that uh, he's done it. 
And now, red has the pleasure of it all. Red will show up and wait with the trunk, having summoned our friend Mr. Belden to come there to discuss an important matter. What makes you think he'd show up for one of us losers? Tell him there's a plot to kill him. Nothing wrong with telling the truth to a man who's about to die. I think he'll come charging to the appointed meeting place. Belden's a curious man. Red will tell him that the three victims of his multi-million dollar financial maneuver plan to kill him. Belden won't believe it at first, but Red will insist. Then Mr. Belden will become irate. We're all rabbits to him. He'll start to leave, at which time Red will have the simple duty of shooting him dead. Well, maybe you wouldn't... Maybe you'd rather I wouldn't continue, but uh, at least you know it can be done. That sounds beautiful. Okay, what happens when someone finds the trunk and gets curious? Blue has the enviable position of selecting the ship under any flag he chooses to take Mr. Belden to any far-off remote port in the world where he will remain unmolested, unclaimed, for a quiet, a very quiet eternity. Yes. Please, no, you. Do? Please step this way. How long did you say this truck has been here, Mr. Wong? It has been unclaimed for nearly four years. Now, the date on the shipping tag seemed to say 1970. It is our general practice to auction off unclaimed property. But when I opened this trunk, as you can see, I had to notify you immediately. Good Lord. As you are a representative of the American government, we feel that Mr. Giles Belden belongs to you. I have here his belongings. Everything you found in the body here? Yes, of course. Billful with identification, credit cards, the like. Keys, various. Oh, yes, and this uh, cassette. Some kind of recording tape, I presume. Hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Wong. The American government appreciates your cooperation. Not at all. I think that Mr. Belden here is more specifically the immediate concern of the Los Angeles police. Now, you understand, Mr. Norman, that this interview is purely exploratory. Uh, no allegations or charges have been made. I've already informed Mr. Norman of his rights. I'm well aware of my rights, thank you, Lieutenant. I'm really more interested in finding out why you think that I, Mr. Berger, could tell you anything about the incredible reappearance of Giles Belden after nearly four years. According to this file, the police conducted a thorough investigation at the time. I was part of that investigation. I talked to Belden's wife, and she was afraid even then that her husband had been murdered. Now, it says here, Mr. Norman, that you informed the police that Mr. Belden was slated for an afternoon franchise meeting the day he disappeared. But he didn't show up. Let's see, it's hard to remember. That's right, that's right. I was with bank officers most of the day. David Graham contacted me, asked me what happened to Giles Belden. That's right. You had worked for him for some time. From the beginning. Vice president in charge of finance. And shortly thereafter, you resigned when he disappeared. Mrs. Belden arranged for David Graham to become acting president of the company. I wasn't too sure of his, well, his qualifications. Without the fire and drive of a Giles Belden, I just wasn't going to take the chance. I sold my stock and bought a publishing house. Big man like Mr. Belden with all that fire and drive. Somebody around him was liable to get burnt and pushed. Isn't that likely? Or maybe even run over. Hmm? I'm not sure of your line of thinking, Lieutenant. Lab reports show he was shot twice in the back, stuffed in the trunk, and shipped to Hong Kong. And Mr. Belden wasn't treated like that by a warm and personal friend. Now, our line of thinking is that someone who was burned or run over by Mr. Belden did it. Now, do you know anybody who might fit that description? Hmm. 
Oh, the uh, relationships seem a little uh, vague in my mind at the moment. Uh, you may be surprised, Mr. Norman. But I'll bet if you start thinking back, you could narrow it down to someone. Maybe even two or three people who were desperately anxious to see that Giles Belden did not remain alive. I'll give it some thought. We'd certainly appreciate it. Lieutenant? Mr. Berger? Now he's going to try to figure out how we know as much as we do. I don't know how much they've got, but it sounds like they have a lot that's awfully close to the truth. And the truth is that you sat around with your two colleagues in a very light-hearted mood, brought on by the prospect of losing a million dollars apiece. And you playfully worked out a plan to murder Giles Belton. But it was all a joke. Jokes don't wind up as mummies in unclaimed trunks. Have the three of you ever gotten together since Belton disappeared to speculate on what might have happened to him? Never. We just assumed that he, uh, that he disappeared. But his reappearance has been in all the newspapers. You're telling me you haven't received one call from either of the others to make some humorous or ironical comment on the way things turned out? No. Then I've got to tell you, Ray, I think you're all lacking a very necessary quality called innocent curiosity. Listen, Perry, I'm not guilty of anything. Do you understand anything except perhaps a bizarre sense of humor? All right, where was it again? Where Green was to deliver the trunk and Red was supposed to kill Giles Belden? An old warehouse office where catered affairs first started. Now, there's a whim, you see, mentioning that. Suppose you round up your two friends and have them join us there tomorrow. Well, I don't know if I can. There may not be time. Ray, if I know the district attorney, you're on borrowed time right now. Before we charge him with murder, I want to find out who else was involved in the conspiracy. Well, there are no names on the tape. Just a man and a woman. I'd like to kill that man. Do it before Tuesday and win yourself an award for cleaning up the ecology. It's not impossible. What? I said, it's not impossible to kill him. CBS presents this program in color. Meet Dick Preston, movie star. We're going to rehearse the scene now, Dick, and we do a nude scene. like could just jump right in with both feet. Yes, I got my feet I'm worried about. This season, he's moving to Hollywood with a whole new act. It's trouble! Right here in River City! Thank God! Dance your toilable cares away. Boy, can a Mr. Dazzle and dance, 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 dance your toilable cares. Cut! Harry, you remember Jennifer Fielding? He doesn't. But I remember every man I ever met who had the cool to ignore me. Four years ago at Belden's estate, you told us we'd each just lost a million dollars. Well, I certainly turned out to be wrong about that, didn't I? Where's Victor Harding? Searched everywhere for him. Not a clue. Have you ever heard from him? Not in years. I just imagine his liver died and they buried him with him. All three of you had keys to this place, didn't you? This is where it all began, right, Jennifer? You and me, Victor Harding, are all friends. And Giles Belden. Tough man with a great idea. When was the last time you were here? A long time ago. We all still liked each other. At least a year before Giles was killed here. What makes you think he was killed here? Because this is where Ray decided he should be killed when he proposed his... You know that I didn't. I don't know anything. And I resent being dragged down here like some conspirator. Whose car is that? It's mine, Counselor. I have a tape recording how Mr. Norman planned the entire murder. That's how I knew where to come. But the tape didn't identify the other two conspirators. There was no conspiracy. I just listened, that's all. Well, Miss Fielding, perhaps we can discuss this in a more comfortable room down at Parker Center. It was all a joke. I told everybody you remember. I told everybody before they left. It was a joke. Ray, don't say anything more. He's already said it all. On tape. Miss Fielding? Come on, let's go. A 
a joke, huh? I'd like to kill that man. Do it before Tuesday and win yourself an award for cleaning up the ecology. Well? It's not impossible. What? What do you think? Is that it? What do you mean, is that it? That's the voice of your client on this tape. Outlining a step-by-step -step murder of one Giles Belden. I'm in the market for an early confession, Perry. You're always trying to do things the easy way. Let's back up a minute. All right, all right, let's go back four years. That's the time when the deceased triggered Ray Norman to come up with this idiotic murder plan. You heard it all. He had taken them for a million or so each. Let's only back up to yesterday. Why did Trag book my client and let Jennifer Fielding go home? Because your client is the killer. Hamilton, I always get nervous when you start giving easy answers and free information. <laughs> well, you know, it's my duty to inform counsel about everything. No surprises. It's the law. I appreciate your cooperation. So I'm going to let you in on something. With what you've got, you won't get past the preliminary hearing. Oh, come on, Perry. The facts of the crime match the plan on the tape. After everything you've just heard, you've got to have a strong stomach to defend a man like Raymond Norman. He's not guilty. And I don't think you can prove he is. I can prove it with this. It could be faked. Voice print analysis says it isn't. Still no proof and you know it. In your newfound spirit of cooperation, uh -uh. I'm sure you'll furnish me with a copy of that tape. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> Well, now, Perry, that's interesting. You can learn Italian, French, German, and how to commit murder, all on a simple home cassette recording. Then I get the girl started transcribing this. I was in that room earlier. I wonder if my voice is on tape. Well, if it wasn't, maybe it's because the room hadn't been bugged yet. Or maybe the tape was edited. That there's a tape at all is curious. But the fact that it was found on the body of the victim, that's no mystery to track. He says Giles Belden got it by bugging the guest house her client and his friends were in. And he told Norman he had it, Norman killed him. And not knowing that the tape was on the body, your client set about to dispose of the corpse just like the three of them discussed. Which would make Giles Belden a very stupid man. He already had all that he wanted from these three people. Why say anything to Ray Norman? Why not just take the tape directly to the police? I don't know, but go on, I'm interested. Someone had to ship that trunk and sign for it. Paul, check on the original bill of lading. Della, I want you to call on Belden's widow. I'm terrible with widows. Hey, I'm terrific with widows. I know. That's why I want Della to handle it. I'll have a talk with the man who jumped right to the top when Belden fell off. We're offering year-round meal tickets, Christmas gifts and the like. For a full year, you can receive up to 12 meals of the month. We've been very well received. Whatever happened to old-fashioned home cooking? <laughs> I don't know, but if it ever comes back, we're in big trouble. From a glance at the company financial statement, you're a long way from trouble. In fact, since Giles Belden's disappearance four years ago, looks like your personal career has skyrocketed. Mm-hmm, but not nearly as fast as your client's bank account. Why did you take over instead of Ray Norman? You won't believe this, but I took over because I refused to shoot a dog. And Mrs. Belden remembered that. You were Belden's right-hand man, the corporation factotum. I was his gopher. Factota means you have a master's degree and a briefcase. Did gophering include such duties as having places bugged, like the guest lodge? No, but it did include continual efforts to do just the opposite. Debug? Mm-hmm. Belden was almost paranoid on the subject. He insisted on having his office and meeting places uh, inspected for electronic bugs on a regular basis. The guest lodge was his particular concern. He did a lot of work there when he was home, making confidential phone calls, the like. His phone calls include confidential personal matters? I would know about that. Come on, Mr. Graham. If Giles Belden was running around, he stopped running four years ago. Did he have a girlfriend? Yes. Who? I honestly don't know. Not that I didn't try and find out. For Mrs. Belden? Yes. That sort of put you in the middle, didn't it? Mrs. Belden wanting to know who, and Mr. Belden constantly after you to have his quarters debugged so that she couldn't find out. People are curious animals, aren't they? Yes, they are. Who did you hire to carry out this continual debugging operation? A man by the name of Ed Stark. Stark Electronics, small outfit out in Santa Monica. Haven't had occasion to use him in four years. I'm not troubled by a guilty conscience. Congratulations. So if you had any idea of nailing a killer when you came here, Mr. Mason, 
I'm afraid you'll find me something of a disappointment. I could hardly think a man's a killer when he couldn't bring himself to shoot a dog. Would you like some coffee? I'd love some. Mrs. Belden, weren't you shocked by your late husband's reappearance? Oh, it's as if he's returned to haunt me. I'm not going to let him, though. He haunted me for years when he was alive. Miss Street, you didn't know Giles. He was ruthless. He had enemies, so nothing surprises me. Not even that there was a tape recording of that whole meeting in your guest lodge? Well, that did surprise me because I don't know how it's possible. Some man with a gadget went over it just the day before. Do you recall who he was? Oh, I forgot his name if I ever knew it. But he was around from time to time. David Graham kept hiring him to make sure Giles' inner sanctum out there wasn't bugged. How well do you know Ray Norman? Hmm. Well enough to like him. He's an honest man. And that's why he hated Giles. I hope your boss gets him off. Then you don't think he killed your husband? That it, I didn't say that. But if he did, I'll have an animal shelter built in his name. Perry. Oh, hello, Paul. Aunt Della said I might catch you here. Listen, I'm still trying to find the flop house Victor Harding is flopping in. It's a funny thing. At the company, they said that Harding didn't even show up to get his million bucks. They practically had to send a search party out to find it. But they did find him and give it to him. Yeah. And the story I get is that he couldn't get rid of it fast enough. After six months, our missing millionaire was flat, broke, and on skid row. That's where we're looking for him now. I got a couple of leads and a hunch I'm getting close. Good. Paul Giles Belden had a girlfriend. I used to have a couple myself. No time anymore. It'll be tough, but see if you can find her. After four years? It'll be tough. There's one thing this town has plenty of, it's girlfriends. I'll throw in an easy one for you. The man who was supposed to debug that room where Trag's favorite recording was made, Stark Electronics. The man I want you to talk to is... Ed Stark? Hey, if you're from the boss, man, would you tell him that he's gonna keep popping these condenser mics like corks from a champagne bottle as, as long as he keeps taping these, these eardrum-splitting rock groups? Paul Drake, Mr. Stark. So I'm looking into the Giles Belden case for an attorney. You hear about it? Who hasn't? I understand you did some work for Mr. Belden on and off. Well... Uh, it wasn't work exactly. It was uh, more like freeloading. I never found what he was looking for. No bugs? Nope. I must have gone over Belden's home and office three, four times. It's nothing. I even showed Graham. I even let him watch the detector. What about the Belden guest house? He was a little sensitive about that too, I understand. <laughs> Between you and me, I think the old boy carried on a little private life of his own from out there. <laughs> David Graham tells me that he hired you to uh, check out that guest lodge just the day before that weekend meeting. Sure did. I charged him a full day for it, too. <laughs> like I said, freeloading time. It was nothing. Now, you're sure you didn't miss something? Because, you see, I heard a tape that was recorded there. Look, all I can tell you is the place was clean when I left it. Now, if Belden had the place bugged himself, well, then he bought himself a whole lot of trouble. I mean, you find out somebody's trying to kill you. And, and you corner the guy with the information. Well, like the newspapers say. What's the guy gonna do? He's gotta go ahead and kill you. Right? The new Perry Mason will return after station identification. All right, the lot of you's up against the wall or you'll never leave Casablanca alive. <laughs> That's me on my General Electric tape recorder, a great entertainer. Not me, my GE. This beauty adjusts recording levels automatically, works on batteries and plugs in and shuts off automatically. Let me put it to you this way. When it comes to tape recorders, GE's got it all together. Now playing all over America, tape recorders by GE, the great entertainer. So, four years ago, this electronics expert, Stark, debugged that room the day before I was there and the conspirators hatched their green, red, blue plan. That's what he said. And no one had access to that cottage until your client and his friends moved in. That someone had to carry a recorder or a bug into that room. 
But if all three of them were in it together... No, not exactly together, darling. Jennifer Fielding, at least, had other interests. She was Belton's girlfriend. Where did you get that? Well, I checked out Jennifer's old apartment. Some of the long-term tenants there said that she and Belton had a thing going for five years, maybe more. And as I remember, she gave a perfectly believable performance of hating Belton's guts. What's Jennifer doing these days? Very nicely. A her million bought a partnership in a posh brokerage firm. And for three years now, she's been dedicated to making her clientele and herself richer and richer. Miss Fielding? Well, hello. Did you come for financial advice or because you miss me? Well, now, what do you think? I think I'm wasting my time flirting with you, and I'm much too busy to waste my time on lost causes. This won't take long. You know I'm defending Ray Norman. You're wasting your time. He's guilty. Are you saying that because you really believe it? Or because you were Giles Belden's very good friend? I wasn't his very good friend. I was his mistress. Did that discovery fill you with moral outrage? Of course. I spent days worrying about your soul. <laughs> my soul may be in trouble, but my future is secure. Now, how does that follow? Because since I was close to Giles, I had no reason to go along with Ray Norman's idiotic murder plan. Which all three of you took as a joke. Oh, is that what Ray told you it was? A joke? Yes, he said you all understood that. Oh, I understood all right. Ray wanted to involve us in what he was planning himself. Assuming that's true, once you knew about the plan, and you and Giles Belden were what you were, why didn't you warn him that his life was in danger? Giles never allowed me to phone him. I was supposed to see him the next night. He didn't make it, and I never saw him again. And I suppose that's what you'll tell the district attorney. Oh, I already have. My attorney doesn't have those eat him alive blue eyes like yours, but he's smart. So he's convinced me that it's my duty as a good citizen to see that justice is done. And when the DA offers immunity from prosecution, it's the duty of a good citizen to protect herself. <laughs> I like you, Perry. You tell it like it is. What are you doing tonight? I imagine I'm going to be spending a lot of time thinking about you. Well, I've thought about it. And she's lying. She knows about the tape. It scares her. So she's lying to save herself. Now, isn't that obvious? Perry? Maybe. But no matter which way we turn, we still get back to that tape. It says one thing, you say another. Now the DA has a witness to confirm what the tape says. But it was all a joke. Everybody understood it that way. But you did tear those colored strips of paper. And the three of you drew them. Yes, but right now I couldn't tell you what color I drew. That's how seriously I took that joke. Well, unfortunately, it comes to your wording, it says. On the stand, I can bring up her relationship with Belden, try to impeach her testimony, prove prejudice, but still... Harry, do you think I'm lying to you? Do you want to withdraw from this case? Shall I get another attorney? Harry, if I thought you were lying to me, I wouldn't be here. Thank you. I only bring up these things because they won't go away. They have to be faced sooner or later. Harding. What? Find Victor Harding. He'll tell you this whole thing was a game, that nobody took it seriously. I'm sure if he's alive, we'll find Harding, and soon. Or well, the police will. He'll tell the truth. He's a drunk. But I trust him. The signature's from the bank receipt when they finally caught up with him to give him his million. You can see from the signature, if the shakes even then. Let's see that bill of lading again with the Avery Manning signature. And you see the signatures match. Avery Manning is Victor Harding. You're absolutely sure? No, I'm absolutely dumbfounded. The expert's absolutely sure. <laughs> so Victor Harding is definitely our Mr. Blue and shipped Belden's body in the trunk to Hong Kong. Mm, he's possibly Mr. Green and Mr. Red, too. Ah, oh, thank you, Della. Della, would you mind playing that tape again? Paul, did that electronics expert tell you what kind of bug was used to transmit the signal to the tape recorder? Emmett Stark wasn't sure. The way the voice was fading in and out, probably something small, inefficient. It's not impossible. Did you hear that sound in the background? It's not impossible to kill him. Now, that's the only sound that doesn't fade in and out. Now, he says it's a foreground sound. As if one of the people were carrying the bug in a purse or a pocket, jingling keys or coins. Except that at one time or another, you can hear every one of the voices fade. So who could be carrying it? 
Their voice wouldn't fade. That's strange. Or in the words of our expert, beats the hell out of me. It's impossible to kill him. Oh, yes, he is. Paul. Oh, thanks, Tom. Drake. How yeah? Kill that man? Do it before Tuesday. Are you sure it's the right one? Oh, well, that sounds about right. Thanks. Well, we found Vic Harding. At the Ray of Sunshine mission. It's not impossible. Mr. Harding? We met once, some time ago, at Giles Belden's place. I'm Perry Mason. You're a hard man to locate, Mr. Harding. My office looked everywhere. No one had seen you, knew where you went. I didn't tell anybody. I wanted people to forget about me. Leave me alone. Mr. Harding, there are things, urgent things, that just can't be left alone. Now, I think you know what they are. Well, I figured you'd catch up with me sooner or later. They say you can't get away with murder. Well, who'd have thought with me shipping them that far away that Giles would show up so soon? I must have been pretty drunk that Sunday afternoon at Belden's. I thought it was some kind of a joke. You know, like a, a game you play. I couldn't even remember what color I was afterward. That's exactly what Ray Norman said. The very next day, Mr. Red called. He's all yours now, Mr. Blue. I was scared to death. I went down the old building. There was one key. There was the trunk with Giles in it, just like he said. So you shipped him to Hong Kong and signed that bill of lading, Avery Manning. You knew that. I wouldn't have believed it. Me, a murderer? When Mr. Red called, did you recognize who it was? I didn't have to. He told me. He said, uh, Ray Norman. After that, I couldn't sleep through a single night. Didn't know which way to turn, where to go. You won't have to worry about that for a while. You're going to be a guest of the city, Mr. Harding. What's the charge? Conspiracy to commit murder. All you have to do is stand up in court and tell the judge all about Mr. Norman's uh, do-it-yourself murder plan. And how well it worked. Lovely Diana Riggs stars in her own new series, premiering Monday, September 10th. Hi, I'm Raphael Rippy, and the matter beats can eat at Jack in the Box. This is a Jack steak sandwich, and these are pretty delicious, too. And this is a taco. This is an onion ring. There might be 10,000 things at Jack in the Box. Pack up the kids, crank up the car to Jack in the Box. Come as you like, come as you are. I like to kill that man. Do it before Tuesday and win yourself an award for cleaning up the ecology. It's not impossible. What? I said, it's not impossible to kill him. I ask you now, Mr. Harding. The voices that you just heard on this tape, do you recognize any of them? Yes. The man's voice outlining the murder plan of Giles Belden, who was that? That was him, Mr. Ray Norman. And the woman's voice? Miss Jennifer Fielding. The other man, who was that? That was me. Well, tell me something, Mr. Harding. What did you say when you heard Mr. Norman describe his murder scheme? I thought it was crazy. I thought it was some kind of a joke. Found out it wasn't. How? Well, he called me the next day and he told me that red and green were finished and I was Mr. Blue, so it was my turn. So what did you do? I got drunk. 
We'll have quiet in the courtroom. After you got drunk, what did you do? I went down to the warehouse. I wanted to see if I really heard what I thought I heard. And what did you find? Well, there was a trunk, all right. A body. I was kind of hazy about the colored paper business. You know, who was red or green or whatever. But that trunk was there with a body in it. And what did you do then? Called a trucking company, had them ship the trunk to Hong Kong. And then I realized that I was part of a murder. So I dropped out of my old life, dropped out of everything. Finish with the witness. Mr. Mason, will you cross-examine? About that phone call you say you received, Mr. Harding, was the voice clear? Not really. Or was it a whisper? Well, not exactly. I don't think... Was well, it muffled as if someone were trying to disguise it? Something like that. I can't remember. Well, then, if you're that vague about it, how did you know it was Ray Norman? Well, he told me. He? Are you absolutely certain it was a male voice? I think it was. But you're not certain. <laughs> Mr. Mason, this was four years ago. So if the person on the phone hadn't told you, you wouldn't even have known whether it was a man or a woman? I guess not. Was anyone with you when you received this phone call? No, I was alone. Were you sober at the time? Well, not what you'd call cold sober, no. You testified that you shipped the trunk. Was that your assignment? You're trying to say... I'm not trying to say anything. I'm asking you if you were the original Mr. Blue. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was. Well, I was kind of hazy about that colored paper business. Who was red or green or whatever? Aren't those your words in direct examination? You're confusing me. I'm... I'm... I'm getting mixed up. I'm sorry you're confused, Mr. Harding. No further questions. <laughs> to that Sunday dinner, Mrs. Belton. Was that the day before your husband disappeared? Yes, it was. Can you tell us anything else that happened that Sunday afternoon four years ago? Uh, you mean about my dog? Yes, could you tell us about that? Giles hated him. He wouldn't even let him in the same room with him. And that afternoon when the dog ran in, Giles told David Graham to shoot him. And what did you do then? Not much of anything, I'm afraid. I, I cried. I tried to reason with him. Look, it's wrong, of course, to speak ill of the dead, but it's no secret. Giles made my life a hell, and I hated him. Because of the way he treated your dog? Well, he didn't treat me much better. He didn't even treat his girlfriend much better. You knew he had a girlfriend? Oh, yes. Didn't that bother you? Oh, no. I was thankful. You see, the more time he spent with her, the less time he spent with me. Mrs. Belden, since you felt that way, why did you stay with your husband? Money. A lot of money. No further questions. You may stand down. Your Honor, the people call Miss Jennifer Fielding. Yes, that is my voice on the tape. And I did hear Ray Norman tell us his plan to murder Giles Belden. What was the tone of communication? The tone? Oh, he was serious, all right. Dead serious. Come on, puppy. Let's get with it. Just once more around the park that I've got to get back inside. Miss Fielding, I am bewildered and appalled by what I've just heard. You did testify that you thought Ray Norman was, in your words, serious. Dead serious in his plan to murder Giles Belden. Yes, I did. So you really believe Giles Belden's life was in danger? Yes. Then as close as you say you were to him, shouldn't your normal reaction have been to run from that guest house and warn him? Well, looking back at that point in time, it's, it's easy now to say what I should have done. Well, let's leave that for the moment. 
If Giles Belden had lived to exercise those options, what would have been the effect? Ray Norman would have lost more than a million dollars. And Victor Harding? The same. What about you? Well, I've already told you how close Giles and I were. Yes, yes. But the court has heard you say on that tape, quotes, the three of us have just been wiped out by that louse. So you considered yourself in exactly the same boat as Ray Norman and Victor Harding, isn't that true? That was a figure of speech. Quite a handsome figure, wasn't it? Since Giles Belden's death was worth more than one million dollars to you. He was worth more to me alive. Through the witness. You may stand down. Your Honor, the people have submitted a tape with the voice of the defendant plotting the murder. Now, we have presented the second party who testified that the defendant proposed his plan in dead seriousness. We have provided the third party who testified that the defendant admitted having killed Giles Belden and ordered the disposal of the body. Now, the evidence is overwhelming. We therefore move that the defendant, Raymond Norman, be bound over for trial in Superior Court. Before you rule, Your Honor, we would like the opportunity to present a defense. Am I calling an expert witness? Very well, Mr. Mason, you may proceed. I call the witness's attention to this piece of electronic equipment and ask him if he is familiar with it. Yes, sir. This is a UHF receiver recorder. Works with a bug. Operates on a bug frequency and records on tape everything that the bug picks up. This works with a cassette cartridge. Mr. Stark, as I understand, you were hired to debug the Belden estate. That's right. By the decedent, Giles Belden? I never met Mr. Belden. I was hired by David Graham. He told me then uh, Mr. Belden was a nut on the subject. So after taking the job, what did you do? I just went about my business. I figured that uh, Mr. Belden had you know, something to hide, or he was dealing in information that he didn't want to get out. Mr. Stark, when was the last time you checked the Belden guest house for bugs? Uh, that Saturday before they had the meeting. Well, then how, in your opinion, could someone have made the recording of the murder plot? Anyone could have carried it in the room with them. You know, a small recorder or a pocket bug used to send a signal outside. What type of miniaturized listening device could be concealed and planted without attracting attention? It's a flat model at, uh, oh, it's about yay big. It has a printed circuit. You could bug somebody without them ever knowing it. That's one thing they all have in common. They're all illegal. Let's get with it, puppy. Come on, once more around the park, and I'm going to get back inside. Mr. Mason, when I gave you permission for this demonstration, you said you'd connect it up. Yes, Your Honor. It demonstrates how the murder plot was secretly recorded. This is a miniaturized bugging device which my associate Paul Drake planted in the collar of Mrs. Belden's dog, like this, a short time ago. This bug is similar to the one someone else planted four years ago in the collar of that same dog, which would explain the jingling sounds on this recording and the way the voices fade in and out as the dog was constantly moving. I ask that this be marked for identification as defense, Exhibit A. Very well, Mr. Mason. Now, Mr. Stark, in your expert opinion, would it have been possible for someone to have evaded your debugging of the Belden estate by planting the bug in the dog's collar, just as Mr. Drake did today? Yes, sir, it could be done. So when Mr. Graham took the dog out to shoot it, and then couldn't bring himself to do so, and the dog ran into the guest house, in your opinion, could the recording have been made at that time? I would say so. So any one of the three principals in the plot could have planted the bug and obtained the recording? Yeah, if they had the right gear. But even if they did, they would have been insane to put that incriminating tape in the trunk. So tell us this, Mr. Stark. To the best of your knowledge, would anyone else, any layman, have the know-how to plant such a bug? Look, uh, I'm, I'm not the type of a guy that likes to point fingers at people. Now please answer the question, Mr. Stark. David Graham, he was always asking me questions about how things worked. Mrs. Belden, well, she got to me a couple of times, too, hinting around about 
wanting to know what was going on between her husband and Miss Fielding out at the guest house. So at least five people possibly had reasons to want to bug that place. But only one person had the motive blackmail and the opportunity, regular access, and the knowledge to do the job. But that person did not know what all the others knew. I don't get you. Well, that person did not know that Giles Belden would never allow that dog in the same room with him. You're that person, Mr. Stark. That's crazy. Were you surprised, Mr. Stark, when you played back your tape, found you'd caught not blackmail information, but a murder plot against Giles Belden? Surprised? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about what happened when you called Giles Belden to the murder scene and played him the tape of the plot against his life. No! I'm talking about what happened when Giles Belden learned from you that instead of debugging his place, you've been bugging it. I'm talking about the moment that made you have to kill him. That's not the way it happened! That's exactly the way it happened, Mr. Stark. You followed the murder plan to cover yourself and you planted this tape in the trunk to incriminate Ray Norman. He was like out of his head. I tried to tell him I was, I was only trying to help him. I didn't want much of a reward. But he said he was going to go to the police. Not just about the people on the tape, but about me too. That's enough, Mr. Mason. I'm suspending examination of the witness to warn him against possible self-incrimination and urge that he retain counsel. We'll take a five-minute recess. Harry, thank you. Ray? It's ironic. Belden hated that dog. The dog caught his murderer. Ah! 